You're listening to The Extra Podcast, a podcast produced by Northview Community Church in Abbotsford, B.C. We take our faith seriously, but we don't take ourselves too seriously. So we invite you to laugh with us or at us. Today we get an update from several pastors from their week away in San Diego at the Evangelical Theological Society Conference. We also talk about the reasons for divorce, violence against women in the Old Testament, and we hear about their church visits in Southern California. Ezra, Greg, it's good to have you guys back. It's good to be back. It's good to be here, man. We're going to dive into where you guys were and what you were doing, but you missed quite the weekend here at Northview. Oh, did we? Yeah, yeah. We had a building update. Ooh. Oh. I mean, regular listeners to this podcast should be somewhat updated with where the building's at and that it's still going ahead, but generally there were still a lot of people. You hear that? Come on, interrupting again. There's our fourth member of the podcast just trouncing down the hall. You going to try and sneak in here, Freddie? Come on in. Close the door. All right. Freddie's joining us at the table here as well. He was also away this weekend. I'm just giving a little update of what you guys missed here. In fact, I wasn't even here either. I had a big part to play in uh, the building update. Uh, helping with the video and some of that stuff, but I was away as well. But anyway, we gave a big update for uh, where we're at. We're still building. And tonight's the AGM uh, yeah. on our time, not listener time, Tuesday. And uh, another thing that's going to be announced today that people might know by now when they listen to this, we are adding for the very first time in Northview's history online credit card giving what? at what? Northview. That's being announced tonight at the AGM, or if you're listening, oh, has been announced. Can you still write checks? Word. Yes. Nice. Yes. Nice. Isn't that a big deal? That's we talked about deal. this being an option a few weeks ago on the podcast. That is a massive deal right there. And, uh, you know, we thought if we're going to do this big fundraising campaign, now is the time to accept online credit card giving. Make it as easy as possible for people to give. So, Adam... Here's the big pushback to credit cards. Isn't it going to cost the church money because isn't there a 2 to 3% little tax or something? Yeah. On it? So we originally, you know, brought this on for the building campaign. Um, but, you know, we also know that a lot of people are going to want to switch their, uh, their giving from automated withdrawal from their bank account to, to credit cards. And so, yes, there is, a, I think it's 2.4 or 2.5% mm-hmm. taken by the credit card companies. And so we're just asking that if anyone out there is going to switch from their automated uh, bank giving, that they, if they do switch to credit card, they give the same amount, but also uh, tick the little box uh, when you're registering to cover the additional fees. Yeah so that uh, your giving doesn't actually go down. So you're basically asking people to consider covering the administrative yeah. cost that the company will yeah. charge the church. That way we can give to Visa what is due to Visa. Yeah, well, I mean, otherwise, think <laughs> about it this so way. That's so gross. <laughs> you know, if, if everyone in the church who does automated online giving, let's just use easy numbers. Let's say it's a million dollars in over a year switches over and no one covers their fees, then Northview expecting their budget to be given a million dollars now has to give what's that twenty five thousand dollars as a fee to the credit card company that's a big chunk of change twenty five thousand dollars can go a long way so we're just asking everyone to cover that 2.5 percent on top of their uh giving but big news so yeah you can now go online on our website and get subscribed to uh credit card giving it's real easy to sign up and to do it uh, we've added really a building neat. campaign on there, so you can That's really add neat. one-time gifts and recurring gifts. Um, but part of the campaign, part of the building update, uh, was that it's just an update. In the new year, we're going to be kicking off an actual building campaign, and mm-hmm. my on. my team, the communications team, is busy trying to figure out what that's going to look like. And no pressure, Adam. None at all. <laughs> now we're doing some research talking to some other churches, seeing what other people are doing around this kind of stuff. But That's great. Yeah. So that's what happened here. Northview. Ezra, you didn't even flinch at my visa joke. It wasn't funny. I thought it, it was... It was a joke? I, I was, said it was gross. What it, joke? 
Like, I didn't you know, hear a joke. Right? Render unto visa. What is do unto visa? Oh, okay. It's, uh, that's like a that's a Bible like reference, a paraphrase right? Paraphrase of yeah. Oh, that's disgusting. It you is, guys are you make me sick. It is interesting yeah. that you asked me this question. Yeah. Freddie decided to answer. I speak for Ezra. So, doesn't this remind you of our whole last week together? Oh, it sure does, doesn't it? You're giving me flashbacks. <laughs> so you know, Freddie, you were a few minutes late. You Correct. know, when we told. Ezra, we were waiting for someone. We said it was Freddie. He said, "Start without me." Why? Why do we need Freddie? He here? did say that. He's. That's not the first time he said that to me. <laughs> you know, it's. My, I'm count. I have a countdown on my phone for how long till I get to move on. Now, to the next thing for for new listeners <laughs> no, who I can, don't, I can, I can I can make you exit faster than <laughs> that, but it's okay. Uh, well, I need a, I need my degree first. So now, listeners who ourselves. are either new to Northview or new to the podcast <sighs> might Good not times. be aware of the. Friendly, fr- friendly, friendly banter we have as pastors. We're all very close friends, and Come there's on. Yeah. several jabs thrown around. So I love Freddie, even Good. though sometimes he's annoying. But I love yeah. <laughs> thank you. you. I received that. <laughs> now, you guys, all three of you. The reason why you've all been—I mean, two of you are regular contributors, but Freddie, we specifically invited you here as well because you guys were all away with several other pastors at the evangelical. The, what is it? Theological, Theological Society. Society yearly conference. Now, where was that? San Diego. Oh, okay. So suffering for the gospel, right? I want to point okay. out that the first few days we were there, it was like a very significant rainstorm, and the sewer system in San Diego is not what I would call effective. <laughs> uh, so for the first few days we were there, the place smelled like a sewer system. Can it smelled... Because very badly. Well, they don't get a lot of rain, right? So it's no. like a couple times a year. It just. Oh, but, but it it actually <laughs> was coming down buckets. Yeah. Oh yeah. So it was. Everyone was out at the local CVS buying an umbrella. I was in the in the drugstore getting some stuff for the week, and the lady behind me was on the phone. At this point, it was just kind of drizzling rain, and she was like, "I don't even know how." To, she's on the phone saying, "I don't even know how to walk out there in this." Like, what am I supposed to do? And I was, I didn't turn around and chuckle, but you know, being a Pacific Northwest guy, I was like, this is literally Normal. every day of our lives. Yeah, yeah but this guys. Way. And then it poured after that. So and, yeah, but that you know crazy. what? That's exactly what people from Saskatchewan say when it comes to and snow. snow totally. Here. Oh, you don't, you don't There's like a our center, snow days? It's sprinkling snow and yeah. no one can drive. And no everything's canceled. Yeah, yeah, snow days with three mills on the ground. You're like, what? This isn't even enough to go sledding in. So, it rained. It, the weather did turn about midweek, and then the last few days they were quite nice. So that, that's at that point that we were no longer suffering for our education. So who goes to this conference? Why did you guys go? What brought you there? What's it all about? So ETS, basically, you have a lot of uh, scholars, um, particularly a lot of uh, seminarians, um, instructors, uh, teachers, professors from various seminaries, and they will be writing papers on specific topics. So ETS is not a conference like a regular conference where you go and you have three or four plenaries with breakouts. E- ETS is more breakouts and just a few plenary uh, sessions. I, I think two plenary talks and then an, a general meeting for um, ETS's uh, members. But it's all about the papers and the breakouts that people engage. So a lot of these scholars would be writing books on specific topics. But before they publish these books, they'll come and test their thesis to other very sharp minds to see, okay, am I am I being heard well? Is my tone good? Is my argumentation strong? And things like that. Or you might find two theologians who have opposing views on a specific issue. And so one will speak for the issue, another will speak against the issue, and then they debate each other, and then there's a Q&A after that. So that's usually like a four-hour segment of uh, interaction, debate, um, uh, dialogue around a particular issue. Uh, and then for the most part, a lot of these papers turn into books later on. 
um, particularly if the the author or the scholar felt like they they didn't get significant pushback or they they got encouragement that this is uh, the right way to go mm -hmm. to go and um, on top of that as well you'll find if someone wrote a book uh, a paper and gave that paper in his particular breakout um, there might be someone there who's who's listening and might even join in as a as a co-author because maybe they're doing research on the same subject and so they can collaborate and maybe even co-author some work so it also becomes a networking place particularly for those people who are high academics it's not something that i would say is fun <laughs> because uh, the the papers that someone is just reading a 25 page paper using very very high language and sometimes you may be like oh my i have no idea what you said there but it sounded good so that's eds for you Wow, I'm glad you said it wasn't quite so much fun because I almost fell asleep just listening to that. <laughs> uh, Freddie, you're a young guy. What brought you there? Was it quite the party as Ezra made it seem, or uh, you know what what made you want to go down? And and what was some of your key takeaways? Uh, I went for two reasons: one, because Cal Meeker went, uh, and I'm a huge fan. And then two, because they really <laughs> pumped it up. Like they made it seem like it was gonna be. Party like of the year. The rock stars of the evangelical world. Uh, this is like Coachella for church people. Exactly. Yeah, okay. Exactly. Right. Like, <laughs> and then I showed up, and then they were like, "Well, just so you know, about half of the sessions you go to, I think Jeff actually said this, about half the sessions you go to are just not going to be great." And I was like, "That's very honest of you. Thank you. It, I mean, it would have been nice if you said that before I got on the plane and came down here." Uh, and then he said, "But about the other half." Are gonna be really good and they'll either be like really good you love it like you you like what they're saying or really good maybe challenge maybe you don't agree but like worth your time you want to interact with them uh so once i knew that i think i was if jeff had not told me that before the first day i was gonna, gonna be really disappointed because i went and i think my first two sessions were the first like the 50 percent. that's garbage like they were not great uh, but then the the afternoon, the first afternoon session was phenomenal. And I was like, this okay, was, made so, the whole day so, worth it. So when you say they were not great, what do you mean by that? Do you mean that I the paper was... I remember nothing they said which because means it was so unimportant. No, it, it means that you did not follow what they were saying. No, I, I'm telling you, I was sitting in the room. So th this is my thing. I don't want to be a theologian, like in the in like the formal sense. I think everyone's a theologian, and that everyone believes things about God, and often says those things either directly or indirectly in the things they say. So I I think theology matters. I think it matters in that you need to be able to communicate to people certain concepts, and the stuff that some of the people were talking about was not pastoral. And by pastoral, that's what I mean. Like, does the theology change the way that I live or the way that I think? And the first sessions I went to were not like that. Like it was, it was nice things to think about God. But as I'm sitting there, I'm like, I don't think that, you know, my buddy who's a framer is going to feel differently about God because he heard this 25 page paper. That's just not, that's not, it's not going to change anything. The one I went to in the afternoon oh. was a guy from the master seminary talking about a theology or the theological, theological background to dealing with addiction. And, and I was like, wow, that, that is yeah, people need that. People need to to know what's going on in the background, how our hearts work, what what is happening supernaturally in leading people down that path. And my friends that are framers, um, landscapers, like trades dudes, regular Joe Schmoes, like they would love to hear that because they're like, well, I have friends from high school that are they're going through it right now. Or I went to Vancouver yesterday to go take my wife out for dinner and drove through the city and there's people everywhere. And some of them look like they're struggling with that. Uh, what is the Christian going to do to help these people? So Though we that would session say, was phenomenal. But, but then, Freddie, I think, again, I, I just want to be fair to ETS to say the conference is not geared for Joe Plummer or Joe Framer. Or, it's not even or, it's not even geared towards Joe Pastor. Yeah. No, exactly. Yeah. No, so this is this is a highly academic um uh, conference for different theologians who will now go into the nuances of uh, biblical texts and subjects and so they are going to think about it from a philosophical perspective so at the end of the day what are they trying to do they're trying to understand okay so uh, this perspective will shape a particular worldview now they're not dealing with how does it play out yeah. 
they are just dealing with what is the world view and how are we to understand this text but then they're going to go deep into the original language or really be very focused in their nuanced language and sometimes you wonder okay how will this help the regular christian in in the pew that's not the point of the paper yeah. yet so it's just let's discuss this particular uh point um and see if it coheres with the entire biblical narrative if it does then we can now have a secondary conversation regarding okay so how does it play out in day-to-day life so at ets there are different out um, breakouts that will deal with pastoral theology so there was some that i took in about counseling and so how do you how how do you um pastor people with addictions and things like that so those i found oh that's very helpful from a pastoral perspective and i can see the ordinary person benefiting from that one but there are others who will argue to say okay so let's talk about this particular word in john 1 and whether it when it is the right word and does it fit well in 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 light of the entire yeah okay so you might sit there and you wonder i have no idea what you just said but there are people in that room who totally got what this person was saying All right, I want to ask some more questions about specifically what you guys heard, but before we get there, I want to know what was the best meal mm. had on this trip? The best meal. Or mm. what's something that stood out to you? Oh, when I went to San Diego, we I, tried this one thing. I wouldn't say it was the best meal I had, but it was the most memorable. Was the one that uh Johnny Mark and I shared a seafood dish and it had octopus on it and i had never eaten octopus before it's pretty good and it was if cooked like well, the little was, baby ones or like no, it was like a i don't even i didn't ask a lot of questions kind of like i just let johnny order it and i i ate some of it and it was okay so what you're saying is you guys travel frugally and share meals <laughs> yeah, totally correct correct yeah. totally everything is a shared meal well i like this though because i also heard ezra that you you and greg greg told me this earlier you guys invited one of your favorite theologians out for dinner so you could chat with him oh yeah and uh you were planning to bring you know hey freddy and johnny everybody come I, along I was this purposefully is purposely this is going to be great we did not invite freddy because we knew freddy would dominate the conversation that's not true <laughs> i would have asked so you would have offended him and, and say dude questions. dude no one cares dude, get out tell of my me face, how <laughs> yeah. my something like that my framer friends would care about anything those you're people saying. need the gospel <laughs> i'm i'm a pastor They i'm do. not going to apologize for that no, no no so you know the plan was hey north few pastors let's take this theologian out and ask him questions be very enlightening this would be great and then once he the 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 person you the are, guest of honor the guest of honor suggested the restaurant Ezra took a look at the menu and said okay uh, looks like no one's coming <laughs> except me and greg we can't afford this on the church's dime <laughs> which i think is just i i actually do think that's great. Yeah. Now i mean uh, to 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 be fair to the to the said theologian i don't think he knew the price. No. of that restaurant no, because didn't. if you look at it if you if you saw the restaurant you wouldn't think that they would charge what they charged. And But yeah. His rationale just, for doing it was that he was staying in the hotel that the conference was at and he was feeling under the weather and he didn't want to go far. So he was willing to to keep to keep his booking with us even though he was under the weather. and he was very gracious in giving us a lot of his time so it was but even just someone who i say this almost every week i'm i'm new to staff but someone who you know to hear that that the pastors of our church when they travel or just in general we're not a church that spends lavishly and take it very seriously how we spend it was a lot of fast food We had a lot of and I loved it. Freddy in and out. Was there in and out? Yeah, no, we there was some in and out. Yes, there was. Yeah. Shake Shack. Oh, Shake really? Shack, yes. Yeah. It's in San Diego. Oh, yes. love Shake Shack so much better. They had a yeah, bagel joint opinion. that I really liked. <laughs> Freddy every morning. Hey, who wants to get a bagel with me? And he get They're two, really good. He would get two bagel sandwiches in the morning every morning. <laughs> That's a normal breakfast. It's... One's not enough. <laughs> Three is excessive, so two is the perfect number. Oh, All right. Freddy. So uh Greg tell me something yeah. that you came away with thinking yeah that session or that talk or that thing what is something mm. I, well let's let's frame it this way everyone can be thinking about this what's something that you think you know is a bit more relevant to hey I could actually bring this home and use this either in my preaching mm. or in my in my pastoral ministry in an Abbotsford Northview context Yeah uh so I went to a session uh that had a long <laughs> 
a very long title of big words that basically meant how to teach better uh, when we're teaching. And so even there, I was like, why don't we just make the title of the whole seminar like something easier to understand? But they had all these super helpful tips and tricks about how to make a classroom context better for those who are learning. And the, 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 the turn that helped me in the conversation was how do we move from, from providing opportunities for people who want to teach to thinking about learning outcomes and what do we want people who are coming to our classes to learn? So rather than saying, hey, this guy's gifted, this this woman's gifted in teaching, let's find a place for them to teach. Let's think to ourselves, what are the things that we want our classroom, our church to, to learn from this? And how do we encourage the teachers to be focused on learning outcomes rather than just, well, I got through the content. And so that's that's enough. And so they were bringing up things like how to utilize different aspects of technology to encourage uh questions and classroom engagement they were they were noticing that more and more uh culturally students are not engaging in classrooms verbally so you'll have the one or two people the freddies of the world who are happy to speak up into a classroom context and ask a question but you have a lot of people in a classroom context who even though they have questions don't don't ask them and so they were saying how they were going through different tools and tricks and tips to to actually get those questions from other people in the classroom so that you can achieve your learning outcomes. So that was hugely helpful for me to hear um, different people from different angles, basically addressing the question of how do we how do we step up our game as people who who teach theology in different contexts. So that was really helpful. Freddie, do you want to criticize anything Greg just said? Was that a worthwhile thing to, to go to? I, you know, I actually, I wasn't there, but I did ask him after and, and he said basically the same thing. So I said, give me a specific example. And he did. So then I, I think I, I'll let it go. <laughs> Freddie great, great work. Great work. Uh, great. All right. Ezra's, Ezra's opening the Bible on the table. So Come he's, on, he's praise prepping God. a sermon here. Are you ready? You ready to give the fire? No, 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 no. I was just going to share what what I found interesting. I mean, there were there were various sessions that I enjoyed. Uh, like I said earlier, pastoral care and how you provide care to people, particularly those who are struggling with addictions. So I found that particularly helpful. There was one by a gentleman called Ibrahim Kuruvela. He's a um, professor of uh, hermeneutics at uh, Dallas Theological Seminary. Phenomenal conversation regarding just how do pastors prepare for sermons um, and all that. But what I found very interesting in particular has to do with uh, a discussion that many Christians have, even in your community groups, and particularly around divorce. So the, the question becomes, okay, so what um, what um, what are the what are the reasons the Bible gives that would give a Christian the the, the right to divorce someone? So um, through the through the years, uh, we've always believed or held on to two reasons. The in first, Protestantism, yeah, in Protestantism, you'd say okay, two reasons. The first would be uh, infidelity. So and, and then the second one would be abandonment. And in particular, if if um, a couple, one of them is a Christian, so she's a Christian, he's not a Christian, and then he decides to abandon her, uh, then she is fine to move on. And others would also nuance it further to say if he abandons her because of the faith. Mm-hmm. And and so and and the reason the reason they would do that um, would come f- um, you'd find the reason in First Corinthians chapter seven. So I went to listen to a um, a, v- a world-renowned theologian called Wayne Grudem. Wayne Grudem writes a book called Introduction to Systematic Theology. It's a book that we study Thursday morning theology uh, here the uh, the Abbotsford campus, Downs Road campus, and also at the Mission campus. Anyway, so Wayne Grudem, well-respected theologian, he's seventy-one years old. So he says, "Oh, I now believe there there are more reasons." for divorce, not just the two, mm. infidelity or abandonment. There's a third. And so he will argue again from First Corinthians chapter 7, verse 15. I'm, I want to read the passage um, just so that you get, a, mm. you get a feel for what Grudem was saying. So this is verse 10 of First Corinthians 7. Uh, the scripture says, To the married I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. So Paul is quoting God. Jesus. Not I, but the, yeah, quoting Jesus. 
uh, the wife should not separate from her husband but if she does she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband and the husband should not divorce his wife so that's very clear okay so thou shalt not divorce verse 12 to the rest I say I not the Lord that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him or if she's willing to live with him uh, he should not divorce her if any woman has a husband who is who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her she should not divorce him for the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband otherwise your children would be unclean but that, but as it is they are holy verse 15 but if the unbelieving partner separates let it be so in such cases the brother or sister is not enslaved God has called you to peace so it's verse 15 that Wayne Grudem zeroes in particularly when he says particularly when the passage says again verse 15 uh, but if the unbelieving spouse separates let it be so in such cases Hmm. cases where the spouse has separated in these cases um, in, in in these cases the brother or sister is not enslaved what Wayne Grudem is arguing is though the, the the Greek word translated in such cases appears nowhere in the plural in the entire New Testament or in the Old Testament Septuagint this is the Old Testament Greek translation so what Grudem decided to do then in his study as a research professor was to read all the ancient manuscripts around the time of the New Testament writings to see how did these words, this, 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 this phrase in such cases, in ancient literature, how was this used? How was this um, phrase used? And so after he did all that study and he began to give people examples and things like that, his argument is in the event, so let's say you have um, two Christians who are married and then one of those Christians begins to behave poorly toward their spouse to, to the extent where you can actually label that behavior abuse. Obviously the spouse would bring the, the, the believing, the believing uh, or the offending um, the offending one to the elders the elders would provide church discipline but if this person refuses to change then the scriptures will say yes now you have to label that offender as a non-christian but you go a step further to say this offender is now separating themselves from their spouse because of his behavior he is abusing this person either pushing the family to unbearable debt or the person is being mean-spirited toward their spouse and abusing them severely. So in those cases, they have chosen to separate themselves or they have chosen to abandon their marital va uh, vows. Mm -hmm. So in that state, then, in such a case, Grudem will argue, then the, um, the, the offended spouse has grounds for divorce so in other words he's saying abuse could also be biblical grounds for divorce however he wants to be very careful there to say this is something that needs to be a that needs to be discerned among the elders of a church so it's not just some yeah. it's not just a spouse deciding you know what she's abusing me or he's abusing me okay i'm out of here no it's kind of like no you sit down with the, with the elders and church leaders and you actually process this together to ascertain yes this is abuse because your spouse has refused to change behavior and his behavior is causing significant harm to you or mm -hmm. to your children, to your family, and therefore you have grounds for divorce. His argument rested on the fact that in every other place in ancient Greek manuscripts around the time of the New Testament, when the plural of the phrase in such cases is being used, it's being used intentionally as kind of like an umbrella terminology of like that, that it's not just that one particular thing I talked about, but it's things like it. And so... Grudem says, because of the way that, that that phrase in particular was used in the ancient Greek world, his point was that that Paul is trying to lift the first the, the Corinthian church's minds above not just that one particular example of a spouse physically leaving the other spouse, but of other kinds of cases where 
that kind of a deserting your spouse could be justifiably uh, said that actually happened if that if that made sense so yeah, that if that if any any kind of behavior yeah. that would leave a spouse or lead a spouse to want to be separated from from the other so anything that a husband right behavior that a husband would do that would make the wife want to step away because you are being abusive yes so anything at all then that may be very well again grounds for divorce again he wants to be to be fair to grudem he wants to be very very careful to say actually this is something that we mm-hmm. discern together as as elders of church of churches where you you sit down with church leadership with friends and family and you walk through this thing together in particular if the offending spouse is not repentant uh, and continues to persist in deviant behavior then at that point the 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 offended spouse or the one the neglected spouse would then have grounds for biblical divorce there so that was a very interesting uh, argument. Now do I say that I I agree with Grudem wholesale? I am not there yet. There were some strong conversations in the van on the way home. Yes. <laughs> yes, I don't know if I'm there. I I I don't know if I'm with him yet. Though again, not to say that I I I I I, I don't recognize abuse. I mean mm. my own my own family growing up. Uh, I saw my dad significantly abuse my mom in the most horrific ways. To this day, the abuse continues. So it is something that I've actually lived through and have seen uh, firsthand. So abuse is something that I do recognize and and I do agree. Yeah, it is appalling. Mm. Absolutely. And there are many struggling. But at the same time, am I quite there yet? Mm, I'm still wrestling with what Grudem was saying. I, I'm, I'm waiting for him to write to write more on the subject. And I read what he's saying and actually think through what he's saying. Hmm. Can I ask a clarifying more. question? Mm-hmm. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7, uh, verse 10. To the married, I gave this charge, not I, but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband. But if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and the husband should not divorce his wife. Mm. The, the first use of the wife should not separate from her husband. Is, this, is separate different from div- divorce there, or is it the same? So in, Same word. Uh, does it mean divorce, or is it just like, nope, they're going to be separated for a time, but no legal divorce is happening? So, as you can push back if you want to, but my understanding of the text is that those are more just uh, synonyms for the same the same idea. That separation and divorce were one and the same. So in our in our understanding of divorce, we have uh, we have separation of the removal of the parties from one another, but that doesn't necessarily mean a legal divorce. Whereas in that context, to be separated from your spouse for a prolonged period of time is functionally divorce. So they didn't have the same kind of legal paperwork system that we have in our context. And so the only way you would know that your divorce is that your spouse isn't actually around. You're not living together. To me, I don't know. I mean, I haven't read this entire chapter right now. Um, but you gave the two reasons uh, for divorce. This one, just reading these couple verses, almost makes it sound like you know, if she does separate, it almost sounds like the problem isn't necessarily in the separating. The problem is in the remarrying. That's See, how I, that's how I read verse ten. Is like you shouldn't separate, but if you do, mm-hmm. you have to remarry your husband that you yeah, separated but, from, but you will or notice, stay unmarried. But you will notice what 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 Paul was saying there. And again, in parentheses there in that verse, you will see uh, the Lord, not I. He will say in verse 10. So he's actually quoting Jesus here. So what is Jesus's uh, position when it comes to divorce and remarry? Jesus is not giving you an out clause. So Jesus said, marry, you're married for life. So this is what Jesus is saying. However, there are people who get divorced. So then the question becomes, how do you deal now that you've already, you, 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 you probably were married, now you're divorced, and now you become a Christian. Now what? Divorce does happen. And even when the Pharisees came and asked Jesus about the whole idea of divorce, then Jesus said, yeah, it's because of your hard hearts. That's why Moses uh, gave you this this um, this out clause regarding, regarding, regarding divorce. And it had to do with infidelity there. 
So again, in the scriptures, you will find the, the what Jesus is talking about regarding divorce has to do with infidelity here, has to do with abandonment. But then the question becomes in this particular text, what kind of abandonment? Now, if someone is already divorced, according to Paul, according to Jesus in this text, should they remarry? Um, and of course, the issue would be ah, if the if the reasons for your divorce mm-hmm. are not legitimate, mm-hmm. then you ought not uh, you ought not remarry. Stay so, as you are. So the encouragement or the permission for a a quote unquote godly remarriage is uh, a a divorce that has biblical grounding. Yeah. Is, so Paul's argument is: look, if the if the divorce is legit, then a remarriage is legit. But if the divorce isn't, then there's no freedom for remarriage, mm-hmm. essentially, is what Paul is saying in, in that context. Though now, in, 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 our, in our day today, though, so you'll have people who are listening to this, and mm-hmm. maybe they were divorced already, and the, their reasons for being divorced were not any of what we have mentioned here, but mm-hmm. the divorce for other reasons that the scripture may say that's not a legit, and then they got remarried already Mm -hmm. so now what do they do now that they're in this situation to which i think uh, the same text will say okay stay as you are Mm -hmm. stay as you are where it does not mean now that you're already you divorce not biblical grounds but now you're remarried now should you divorce the one you're now remarried to so that you can no 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 no, the scriptures no stay as you are stay as you are great i want to move on but uh I also want to say for anyone listening who has questions or is going through a a difficult a difficult time in their marriage, this is you know uh, everyone has uh, their own unique story and challenges, and uh, I just wanted to plug our care ministries here because we have amazing care ministries and care pastors who would love to chat with you if you are struggling in your marriage or just want counseling. We also just put up posters this week for uh, divorce care and divorce care for kids for anyone who uh, wants to be involved in those ministries. But reach out to the care ministries here if that is something you need. Care, um, care at northy.org will get you uh, the connections you need. Yep. So email care at northy.org. Yep. Okay. Freddie. Do you have a, I want they have one more thing I want to talk about before we go and we're running out of time but do you have a, a highlight you want to share before we move on sure uh, the one that the session that I went to that I enjoyed the most besides the counseling one where the guy kind of talked about the theological foundation for a background of, of addiction uh, was on Old Testament violence and and for obvious reasons I think this is a huge stumbling block for people and it was not Old Testament violence in general, but or Old Testament violence towards women, um, and in our cultural milieu, that is, um, that is a thing that people do struggle with. Uh, and whether it is someone that like that's the reason they don't believe in God because the Old Testament is sexist, patriarchal, whatever, or it's just I I have a hard time understanding how my Old Testament portrays the same God as the New Testament when the Old Testament includes these kinds of stories. So regard if for the Christian there was stuff to talk about so that they could understand that the God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. Jesus Christ reveals the same God, the same God who was on Mount Sinai, the same God who rescued Israel. It, God hasn't changed. He's the same yesterday, same forever. Uh, and then for the non-Christian to kind of give them an unapologetic. And it was two ladies who presented, and they were both brilliant. Like yeah. one, what both of them were from from seminaries, and they, they teach masters and THM level classes in, in original languages. And, and they were they were so clear. They did a phenomenal job of defining their terms and, and walking through kind of two big texts. One is from Second Samuel 13, the Amnon, Amnon attacking Tamar, mm. or raping Tamar. Mm-hmm. And then the in Judges 19, the Levite, the Levite's concubine going through the same thing. So both of them are really, really sad stories that kind of that show the depravity even within nice people, nice church people, or for, for them, the Old Testament, mm. Old Testament Israel. Uh, so these things do happen. They happen everywhere. They happen anywhere that there's people. Um, and God is not happy about it, but the, the stories are written down so that we would see that t- the times haven't changed. Things change, but not really. Uh, and, and these women did a great job of walking through the text, explaining what it meant in its context, and then and, and bringing it alive for today. Mm. So I, I learned a lot, and hopefully I will 
when I get the opportunity in a Bible study or in a sermon, be able to hmm. share that knowledge with others. Uh, what is a THM, Freddie? What does uh, that mean? Theological masters? I actually have no masters idea. Masters of theology. Mm -hmm. yeah. So for those who find this a very interesting topic or has been a stumbling block or has friend, uh, anyone that has friends that, that wrestle with this or bring up passages like this, uh, did you walk away with any resources, books, blogs, articles that these women or anyone else recommended that uh, go deeper on this topic since we don't have tons of time to dive into it? Uh, because it was ETS? No, I did not. I did get the ladies' emails, and I'm going to ask for a copy of their paper, which I'm happy to pass along. Now, some of these, wants. So, so the, 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 the beauty of ETS, and Freddie, maybe you might want to take advantage of this, is uh, if someone, uh, one of the presenters, if their paper is very intriguing and striking, if you email them back and just said, hey, I heard your session, I love just a list of books that mm. I can, resources I can go to, because I want to do some thinking deeper, deeper thinking into some of the things you, you, you are talking about, they'll be happy to send you an entire bibli bibliography of books and articles and things that they uh, helps resources all right can, yeah so, so freddie's gonna reach out to them if you are listening and you really want to get yeah. in touch with them you reach out to freddie and Come he'll on. pass on that info freddie how can we get a hold of you what's -E your f-r-e-d-y at north u.org f-r-y f-r-e-d-y at north u.org one d in one freddie d. or actually i have f-r-e-d-d-y also just for because the people, people who... routinely misspell my name. All right, sounds so good. So I, I, we're prepared for everything here. <laughs> Freddie with a Y, let's just say that's that. That's right, that's right. Um, let's move on. Guys, you also, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, visited some churches mm -hmm. while you were down in Southern California. Tell me about that. Why did you go and what stood out to you? Why were you visiting churches? Don't name the names, you know. As uh, religious coaching us. The Glass Castle, is that one? What's that <laughs> one? <laughs> uh, we, uh, so I think the reason we go at churches is because we recognize that we have lots to learn and we have a, a ton of stuff that we could do better on. And we have, um, just because things are growing here isn't because we're amazing. It's because God and his grace and providence in this season is choosing to, to bring people to us. Amen. But that, does, that doesn't mean we, we shouldn't be trying to get better at everything that we do. So we visit churches to try to learn, to see what they're doing, see, see what's going on. Uh, I think this was probably the part of the trip that, uh, prompted in me a lot of the, of thinking and that kind of stuff of, of ministry and Sunday mornings and all that kind of stuff. So it was hugely helpful just in terms of sparking thoughts and ideas in my own head. I think we crushed Freddie's soul because Freddie is an optimist. He is a guy who, who is happy to engage in things and enjoy experiences. And I'm not a that pessimist. way. You're a pessimist. And so I, I am very able to see glass glasses that are half empty. Uh, and give so, me an example. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, I think for me, my mind tips towards the things that should be done better. And so my, it's harder for me to just be engaged in, in the moment because I'm, I'm overly. So if analytical. I'm hearing you right, you both walk into a church together, a new church, and you're pointing out the things that you don't like or that they could improve on. And Freddie is just wide eyed going, wow, look at all those amazing well, I, things. They're I'm, doing letting them speak in their own context so i try to appreciate what i can and then after i'm like i i am actually quite a critical person so i just as a habit in my attempts to partner with the spirit as the spirit sanctifies me makes me more like jesus uh, i try to say at least one positive thing before i move on to the negative uh and i think i might have been the only person who did that <laughs> that was when we when we were in a church service there was a sermon about about uh gratitude and thanksgiving that kind of stuff and after immediately after the service freddie's saying to me greg that one was for you man that sermon was for you greg <laughs> you pay attention <laughs> So and then Greg says, I'm just thankful it's over. So that's look, right. That's I, right. I think I can appreciate things that are done well. I just, I, it's my mind does move more towards the analytical. And the what criticism. is one thing you guys walked away from going, oof, Northview needs that or should do that? Anything? Or wouldn't it be cool if we could implement that or have that type of welcome center or coffee shop or anything? I think uh, it, you could go to any church mm. and look at what they do and you could say, man, we could do that better. So so I'll say this. Uh, I really love our church. Uh, 
so if you came here on a Monday night and you walked through the hallways of our building and you saw how many women are in the word of God, man, that is enough to edify you in big ways. Just to thank God for our community, thank God for our church and what what we're doing. When you come to the weekend services, the way people sing, the people the way people give, uh the messages preached, uh the worship teams doing their thing, like it's remarkable. So if you go to other churches, of course, you'll see some ways that they do things better uh, or differently. And so for you, it may be, oh, that would be, if we did that, it would be better uh, the way they they would do their worship. So we, we had a very um, engaging conversation regarding, okay, so should we use lights mm. um, and, and a little bit of smoke to, to just make the lights look even better so that the ambience is just phenomenal. So there are those in the car who are like, yeah, that'd be totally fine. I'd, I have no problem with the lights. And then others will be like, no, the lights are so distracting. And so we discussed to say, okay, so is it a generational thing? Um, what is our target audience? Our target audience, just young families. Okay, but should we just focus on young families? What do we do with mm-hmm. the seniors and the young? Because the Church of Jesus Christ needs to be multicultural, multi-generational. Mm-hmm. So now what do you do there? So it was, it was interesting to be down there just to see how yeah. different churches do stuff that that van heard a lot of strong conversations oh man we had we had <laughs> there was a lot of conversations Why didn't i you know i knew i should have given you guys a microphone <laughs> that, to yeah. just put in that van and just a lot of it would have been redacted there was, I think. A, there was a lot of stuff in the van that at one point ezra as the driver and the father figure in the van said i have to stop you right there and then he would he would chime into the conversation Pulls over on the side of the highway <laughs> you tell. guys be quiet right now or yeah. i'm leaving you on the side of the road oh, man. <laughs> So, I mean, it was, it was, it was, um, so all that to say, I don't know if I can walk away and say there was mm. something to say that, oh, no, if you should do that, or no, if you should do the other. But mostly just caused us to ask a specific question why do we do what we do the way we do what we do? You know, should we, um, God willing, if we build a new building, when, not if, when we build a new building mm-hmm. here, uh, what kind of gear should we have in that building and what kind of services should we run? Should we try and copy some of the things we saw or should we be very unique to the needs of our immediate community regarding how we run the services, starting from the hospitality, the layout and all that. But again, we're in Southern California where they can have yeah. nice seats and all this outside in lawns, mm-hmm. but we can't do that particularly here in, in B.C., because of the the weather we have, so we can do it for like four weekends a year, possibly. Well, Dave, Dude, it rains on fall kickoff. We can't even get fall kickoff right. <laughs> well, Dave right. just just put up those two brand new picnic tables right outside the staff entrance, and like doing that in like October. Yeah, I was like, that's a few months too late. I mean, oh, they look great, it's but gonna... no one's gonna use. They're gonna be quite weathered before anyone sits yeah, they'll in. They'll be ready for next year. Yeah. They'll look vintage. Yeah, but then. we will get a good day in February, March. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It'll be a beautiful day. And the sun hits that part of the property really good in the morning. So should be good times. All right. Any last words about our church visits? It made me, uh, like, as you said, it made me uh, really just be thankful for what, what God's doing in our midst and what God's doing at Northview and his kindness to us in this season. Amen. And so uh, I think there's... There's lots of things that I uh, appreciate about what God's praise doing. God. So, praise God. Praise mm-hmm. God. So Freddie, Freddie's been chipping away at me with my gratitude. So the Holy Spirit through Freddie. Come on. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> he uses even me. Amazing. All right. Uh, last question. Did anyone uh, bunk with a snorer on this trip? No. Ezra, what was your room like? Oh, my room was phenomenal, dude. <laughs> I was I was in a, on a couch in the living room. We we did an Airbnb thing because we're quite a number of us, and we had invited some dear friends of ours who passed uh, smaller churches and things like that. So we decided to bunk all of us together. So we got this uh, Airbnb duplex, uh, seven guys on one side, seven guys on the other side, but wow. they, they want enough beds to go around. So I was in the living room. On a on a cozy couch. So Ezra time, embodied so. servant leadership by sleeping on the worst <laughs> mm. possible mm. surface for Amen. five nights in a row. Not, not a single wow. complaint, too. He, he was not one of the cheeriest in the morning. You I know? mind a little bit. 
But I get in there for a little morning hug. I cheer him up. That is not true. You've never offered a morning hug. I try to greet you with a holy kiss every morning, and I got a firm no. A firm no in the Lord. Freddie, maybe this is just something to do with you, maybe. Really? Man. Well, I brush my teeth and everything, so I was like, I... It's not your teeth. It's just you. Oh, okay. Well, on that note, I think I'm going to call it a day. Uh, thanks for joining us again on the Extra Podcast. Uh, if you want to find out anything else uh, about our church or about anything you've heard, just go to northview.org. See you next time.